Welcome to the Raising Boys and Girls podcast. I'm Sissy Goff. I'm David Thomas. And I'm Melissa Trevathan. And we're so glad you've set aside a few minutes to spend with us today. In each episode of this podcast, we'll share some of what we're learning in the work we do with kids and families on a daily basis at Daystar Counseling in Nashville, Tennessee. Our goal is to help you care for the kids in your life with a little more understanding, a little more practical help, and a whole lot of hope. So pull up a chair and join us on this journey from our little yellow house to yours. The Raising Boys and Girls podcast is brought to you in partnership with Minnow. Minnow provides meaningful screen time and shared experiences for families to help you grow in your faith together. Check them out at podcast.gominnow.com. That's podcast.gominnow.com. Hey, David Thomas. Hey, Sissy Goff. So excited that we're back. Me too. Really fun. We have been talking so much about how we've been loving this podcast and continue to be so grateful for Minnow helping us do this and that we're getting to talk together about so many important things and getting to talk with some amazing people too. We've loved it. We hope you're having as much fun as we are. (laughs) We're having a great time. We are, except we're having tacos kind of every time we record, which... Maybe you could go find the closest taco to you today just to celebrate with us. We would highly recommend tacos with this podcast. Yes, which kind of lends itself to what we're talking about today, because maybe tacos could be playful. I feel more playful when I eat tacos, probably. So that's what we want to talk about today is being a playful parent and the importance of play in the lives of kids and really our lives, too. David, if we were going to kind of ask our question, what for you, helps you have more of a sense of play in your life? I would say lately that has been watching Ted Lasso with my kids. So I have all older adolescents, and we have laughed so hard doing this together. It's been a really fun tradition. And if you haven't seen the show, he just is the most glass half full character on television right now, which we all kind of need in this particular time in history. What about you? What's helping you play? Well, I think he's the answer to almost every question these days, but having a two-year-old in your life, I mean, just that sense of wonder that he has and playfulness and nothing is very serious unless he says sad and then he's out of it 10 seconds later. And one of the things that I've realized recently is I like myself better when I'm playing more often. I mean, maybe that's part of us being ones, but would you say that's true about you too? A hundred percent. Yes, which really kind of leads into what we want to be talking about today. We're living in such an intense time. I mean, just what's going on culturally and historically, but I think just even before 2020, what we were moving into and what we really talked to so many parents about is that we are living with this intensity that I think no generation before us has probably ever lived in. And intensity can choke out playfulness. And that makes it so much harder with kids. And so in light of that, I think it's really important for us to talk about play. And we could talk a lot about being ones on the Enneagram and play. But I think what we sometimes will do then is structure play and plan playtime, which is sometimes helpful. But it's more like we're planning it for the kids we love rather than engaging in play ourselves. And Melissa is actually the one who wrote this chapter in Intentional Parenting, and she has this quote that I love, and she says, it's important to experience the joy of playing with your children rather than just creating it for them. Hmm. I would just say, too, I think for a lot of parents, play isn't instinctive. It doesn't feel natural, and that's okay. That's okay. I think we can train ourselves in directions that aren't as natural. And for you to figure out what play looks like within who you are as a parent, hearing us talk about the importance of kids needing it. And so I think how often I hear a lot of dads talk about enjoying time with their kids when they run errands and that they've got to accomplish a list of things to do, but figuring out within the task of running errands where you could even fold playful moments into it. 
And so I think about a dad who talked about, I needed to go to Home Depot. There were several things I needed to get, but I saw they were doing a kid's woodworking workshop for free there at that point. And we stopped off for 15 minutes and made something in that time and figuring out how those kinds of things could fit within the rhythms of what you do, but also who you are. And in light of play, at Daystar, we have 15 counselors on staff. Two of those counselors are play therapists because we believe play is so important with kids. And if they were sitting here, what they would say to you, and and really the premise behind play therapy is that play is the language of kids. And there's so much research on what play does for kids. It strengthens so many important skills. And I found this definition and this article about play from the American Academy of Pediatrics that I loved. And it says, play allows children to use their creativity while developing their imagination, dexterity, and physical, cognitive, and emotional strength. Play is important to healthy brain development. It is through play that children at a very early age engage and interact with the world around them which is just such a picture of how important it is and that pediatricians across the globe are validating that. And I also came across this great study out of the University of Maryland that said play enhances social skills, confidence, and resilience, which obviously every one of you wants for the kids in your life. And insufficient playtime has been linked to depression, anxiety, inattention, and behavior problems. So the reality is kids need to play. Kids need to play, and they need to play with us. It's not just that we need to create playtime for them. And we're often, again, in this intensity, in this busyness of life, in this day and time, we are not playing. And so it's for them. It does all of those rich things that we just talked about. And there are things that research says it does for our relationship with them, including laughter and play, strengthen your bond with your kids, Play with your kids resolves conflict and bolsters the mood of everyone involved. And play even creates more oxytocin, which is considered the nurturing hormone. And so it's creating all of these good things in terms of even biologically in our bodies, but relationally and who they are, these character strengths. So it's just so important. And David, what do you think in terms of things that can block it for us and make it harder for us? What would you add? I was thinking you previewed well a few minutes ago when you talked about our Enneagram number. And I think we've talked before on this podcast, we're both ones, the reformer or the perfectionist. We are known to be taskmasters. We're efficient. We're great committee members because we love a list and we like to check things off. And if you're listening and you're not an Enneagram one, but you just bend toward being a high structure person, if you're more the type A personality, I think play can be even more difficult for you and knowing yourself well enough to know what gets in the way. But I think, you know, for every parent, whether you've been that direction or not, just the busy pace of life that I think we're all experiencing. And I I think back on a conversation with a good friend of mine years ago who took his young son, I think he was five at the time, to the park. And he said, David, here I was at the park with my son, but returning work emails on my phone. And my son kept trying to get my attention over and over. And he kept saying, Dad, watch this, look at this. And he was climbing on these bars and hanging upside down. And he said, I would look up and on occasion comment, you're doing great. That looks fun. And he said, at one point I looked up and he said, Max, you know what? I used to love hanging upside down just like that when I was your age. And his son looked at his dad and he said, it still might be fun. Mm. And I think that statement or some version of that statement is so often what our kids are asking. Will we just consider the possibility that it might be fun to do some play Mm. again? And so I think a question we'd want to ask you is, what about you makes it hard? for you to play. What gets in the way uniquely as you know yourself? Mm. The Raising Boys and Girls podcast is brought to you in partnership with Minnow. Did you know that Minnow has an award-winning children's Bible written by VeggieTales creator Phil Vischer? The Minnow Laugh and Grow Bible for Kids is more than a children's Bible storybook. It's a deep, engaging, and whimsical gospel experience. 
Each Bible story is vividly illustrated, takes just minutes to read, and includes a family connection to encourage readers to learn, talk, and pray together. Find out more at shop.gomeno.com. That's shop.gomeno.com. I was thinking about, I don't know how many years we've been doing parenting seminars. What do you think? Long 12, time. 15, I know, long time. And I feel like probably across every parenting seminar we teach, I think there are three main themes we talk about. One is it's never too late. Two is to look at your own stuff. And three is to enjoy your kids and to play with them. And I know in the Raising Girls content, I talk about how girls who are delighted in feel more delightful. It just ekes into who they believe that they are and their level of self-esteem, in which we talked about the statistics earlier, but we see evidence of that. I could probably name the kids right now whose parents, I think, play with them the most, enjoy them, where they're not teaching them, not correcting them, not instructing them in some way, but they're just spending time with them to enjoy them and play with them. And I think those kids' relationships are markedly different with their parents. And it's challenging. It's easier to get on the floor and play when they're little. Although when I think about my mom and her raising me all those years, there's one time that I remember her bragging on herself, which is so funny because my mom never really did that kind of thing. And she used to talk about how there was a time that I had my best friend over, and I don't know what grade we were in, like second grade. And we were playing on the floor, and my mom was playing with us on the floor. And she looked at my mom, and she said, my mom never gets on the floor and plays with me. And again, I'm sure her mom had a lot to do. My mom at the time had one child, whereas I think her mom had several, and there was a lot going on in their house. But how important it is to get on the floor and play. And then, again, it can be easier at that age, but then you fast forward to it's a lot harder with adolescents sometimes to know how to engage with them. And that's where you've talked about before, finding things that they love and jumping in on those things. How can you engage them about that? How can you surprise them? with a sense of play. And one of my other favorite stories over the years of thinking back through parents is we had a mom who was involved here for a long time that we adored named Marky. And she just was so fun. And she just had this wonderful sense of play and adventurousness. And I remember her daughter telling me that they were at the grocery store together one time and some song came on that they both loved and they were on different ends of the same aisle. And she looked over at her mom and her mom started kind of dancing in the aisle and she started dancing and they ended up, I mean, now it would be on TikTok, this full out dance thing where they're dancing towards each other in the aisle, no telling what the other people were thinking around them. But I love that that mom took this silly moment and just created this sense of play. I mean, out of all the things that we're talking about this season in the podcast, I think it is hands down one of the most important things we can do that invests in the lives and the hearts and even the face of our children, because what we communicate to them about who they are is also what they believe God sees in them too. And to spend time with them in that way means we believe they're worthy of that from us and that He wants to engage them in that way too. And so we really do want to lean in. So let's talk about some intentional practices. Let's do. I think a great thing to do with kids of any age really is to have a family game night. And the kids maybe even get to pick the game. And so, you know, little, maybe it's Mousetrap, maybe it's Candyland. What was your favorite game when you were little? Monopoly. Monopoly. That was fast. Mine was Candyland, hands down. So they get to pick like that. Will you tell what you've been playing as a family lately? Shanghai Rummy. Shanghai Rummy. I thought you were going to say Spicy Uno. Y'all moved on. We have moved on. Okay. We have. But we all that shared to say we love a good card game. Yes. And I love, I don't know if this is true for you, but I love how many times I hear kids in my office tell stories about playing cards with their grandparents. Oh, like that's something yes. that you can do across generations. Yes. I used to do that with my grandparents. I loved it. No. We're playing Mexican Train and Phase 10 a lot. Those love are both those awesome too. ones too. Yeah. You know what else I think we should add to the list? What? Impromptu dance parties. Ooh. Yes. Put some music on while you're making dinner. I often will coach parents to put music on when they pick their kids up from school because 
oftentimes they have expended a lot of energy, cognitive energy, relational energy, emotional energy, Mm. and they're tired. And that's the time when we're most vulnerable to asking questions like, how was your day? Mm. And they don't want to talk. And so just put on some music and listen. Okay, so what do y'all dance to at your house? Well, we've been known to put on some Motown, which I love. Yes. I know you love. Yes. We also will play some Christmas music in non-Christmas seasons, oh, which is really you know fun. illegal in some households, but not that's in ours. Fun. I love some good Kirk Franklin. You do. That's pretty fun to dance to too. Motown, yes, Kirk is. Franklin, CC. I don't care what <laughs> tempo CC Winans is singing. She's great in the car. I was singing to her driving over today. And I think the last thing I would add to the list is even to encourage you as a parent to think back on some of your favorite memories growing up. Like even you talking that that immediately took me back to playing cards with my grandparents when I was a kid. What were some of your favorite memories with your parents, with your grandparents that you can reenact and even out of that brainstorm a list of 10 things you could do? right now where your kids are to bring more of a sense of play into your family. It could be a picnic on the floor. I love that story you tell about the family where the mom surprised her kids and did that. That's a great thing to do. Dance parties, like David said, family bike ride, where we're not teaching again, we're not instructing them, we're not correcting them, we're not criticizing them, not that any of you ever do that unintentionally, but we're just playing and enjoying and investing in who they are as a result of that play. I love those ideas. So our challenge this week, as you think around this topic, would be go back to that question, ask yourself, what about you makes it hard for you to play? And then a follow-up question you could ask is, what could play look like in the life of your family this week? Have fun. David's last question, what about you makes it hard for you to play? Question's kind of haunting me some. So I was thinking about talking today about playfulness. I was sitting at my desk looking out the window, and there was a swing that had been there for a couple of years. No one's really been on it, but I love it, but I don't swing on it. Then I remembered my bicycle on the back porch. It's one that I had when I was a child. I love that bicycle, had it all fixed up, but I don't ride it. Down in the basement, there's tennis rackets, there's rollerblades, there's even a little car in the basement, fits in the basement, so small it's like a toy, but it really won't start. What about me makes it hard for me to play? I just started thinking about that. I was thinking, okay, and I want you to think about this too. When was the last time you played? And I remembered with Sissy and Aaron and Kathleen, I played pickleball. It was the first time to play. And before I knew it, I was running toward the net and took a nosedive. When I got up, everybody was silent, and Sissy said, You don't have to be so intense. This is fun. And then I remembered Sissy saying that intensity can choke out playfulness. Well, it sure was doing that with pickleball. Sometimes you may say, and I say, I'm just overwhelmed. There's too much to do. It feels irresponsible. I'm just not being productive. I don't have time to play. I'm way too tired, maybe. I'm afraid I'll look like a fool. I can't think that fast. I read recently that if you're going to be playful, you have to be open to being a fool. Well, I think I was afraid I was going to look like a fool. I have a t-shirt that was given to me that says, used to could, because I say that a lot. Used to could ski. I used to could cook. I used to could dance. I used to play that game. Used to could. I think right now, just thinking about you as parents being playful, what is it about you that makes it hard for you to play? Because it is so very, very important. So I kept thinking. And then, of course, there was an interruption. There was a knock at the door. I went to the door and looked down at this mass of curly hair, a big smile that lit up these blue eyes, 
and these little bare feet belonging to a -a two-and-a-half-year-old, Sissy's nephew, Henry. Henry ran in to the other room where his toys were, and he started to play. And then I heard my name. Hottie! Henry sees me as Hottie. I went in to where he was playing. Henry was so immersed in the present. There was no purpose. There was no goal. He was just joyfully playing. And for me, no more thinking, analyzing, and trying to figure out what was going on in me that made it hard for me to play. So I played, and I experienced playfulness, which is so much of what play is about to experience. Psalm 34, 8, Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, play and see that play is good. How we need to be reminded of that. Acts 14, verse 27 and 28. Paul and Barnabas have been out traveling, and they come back, and they're giving a report to these folks about what all has happened. The last verse, 28, it says, Then they settled down for a long, leisurely visit with the disciples. I know that maybe that doesn't sound like a really, really deep verse there, but to me it is. What does that mean, to settle down? I think what Henry was teaching me, it meant being in the moment, to be present, to be spontaneous. As adults, we rarely do that. Psalm 118, 24, this is the day the Lord has made. This is the day. So I settled down. Kids, they teach us to play. They may say, join me. Don't teach me. Don't tell me how to, which is what we usually try to do. They may say, be with me. Or they may say, watch me. What a delight for you and me to be able to say, that's my kid. To claim them. They love to be claimed. Watch me jump off this diving board. Watch me, watch me, or come with me. Kids teach us. And so often you'll hear adults say, I've forgotten how to play. It's been so long. I think that us reminding each other by playing that it's contagious, that laughter is contagious. Jeremiah 30, 18 and 19 talks about Thanksgiving. And then the last part, laughter will spill out of the windows. It spills out, and as it spills out, it's contagious. Oh, how we affect each other with laughter. Sometimes we don't even know what we're laughing about. Sissy said again at the very beginning, intensity can choke out playfulness. And that's really what I would say to you as parents, to all of us as adults. We get so intense. And that is reflected so many times in the kids, that intensity that's there. And as so many folks right now have been affected by the pandemic and the loneliness and rejection, there has been an intensity in our country. There's an intensity in our families, in our homes. Intensity can choke out playfulness, but we need to be playful. We as adults need to reflect And bring out the playfulness that's there. I love in Zechariah 4, verse 5, it talks about that the new Jerusalem will be a picture of kids laughing and playing. I love that there's such a vision that we have throughout the Bible. And it says the children will be playing, the naturalness of playing. One of the pictures of playfulness that I was reminded of is Aslan in the line, the witch in the wardrobe. And I want to read just a portion of this as a reminder to you and to myself that we can play now. We are free to still play. And when we are in the midst of intensity, which we will be, how we can encourage and help each other. When Aslan has been killed by the witch, And he comes back. He's been resurrected. 
and the kids, Lucy and Susan, are jumping up and down, and they just are overwhelmed with happiness. And he says, I feel my strength coming back to me. And then he says, children, catch me if you can. And then he makes a leap high over their heads and landed on the other side of the table, laughing, though she didn't know why. Lucy scrambled over it to reach him, and Aslan leaped again, and then a mad chase began, and around and around they went. He would almost let them catch his tail, and he would dive between them and toss them in the air, and this is a description of playfulness. They all three, it says, they rolled over together in a happy landing, heap of fur and arms and legs. It was such a romp as no one had ever accepted Narnia seen. And the funny thing was that when all three finally lay together, panting in the sun, the girls no longer felt in the least tired or hungry or thirsty. I love this. I love seeing this in the movie. Because at this point, we have just a picture. And these words, and I love this with Aslan, it says that even though there was a battle going on, even though the witch thought she had won, and there was this intensity that was happening at that very moment, Aslan played, and he chased. And the girls played with him, and they no longer felt tired or hungry or thirsty. There will come that time where we will not be hungry or thirsty. We will know and experience real playfulness, real freedom there. Aslan, right after he's played, he says, now back to business. He says, I'm going to roar. And right after that, he, with the girls on his back, goes to the intense battle that's going on at that point. May we still play even though there's a battle going on, even though there's intensity, we need each other to remind each other that someday the battle will be over and we'll be free to play forever. Until then, we still can play and let our laughter overflow out the windows. And when that intensity comes, may we remember that we can still experience playfulness and trust that the intensity doesn't have to choke out the playfulness, that we can trust our relationship and trust that someday the hurt, the pain, the loss will be gone. Until that day, we get to remind each other to play. The Raising Boys and Girls podcast is brought to you in partnership with Minnow. Minnow helps you make screen time meaningful for your family, which shows kids love and values parents trust. Check them out at podcast.gominnow.com. That's podcast.g-o-m-i-n-n-o.com. It's our joy to bring the experience and insight we gain through our we work beyond the walls of the We are so thrilled to be partnering with our friends at Menno to more bring help back and the Raising Boys and Girls podcast. Your journey of raising we boys all know that devices are here to stay. So if you want to make screen time meaningful for your kids, Menno is for you. A new streaming service designed just for kids. Menno has over 2,000 episodes of fun and faith-filled shows that have been carefully curated by moms, dads, and church leaders, so it's safe for your family. Check them out at podcast.gominnow.com. That's podcast.gominnow.com to start your free trial.